Knowledge is power, and this is powerful stuff. Wellness Education Cannabis Advocates of Nevada present the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour with your host, Jen Solis. For the next 60 minutes, we'll take an in-depth look at the cannabis reform revolution sweeping the nation. The phone lines are open at 731-1230. That's 731-1230. Or toll free. Toll free. 1-866-820-5528. That's 1-866-820-KLAV. Now, let's bring on the host. Here is Jen Solis. Hi, everybody. This is Jennifer Solis with Nevada Cannabis News. To my right is Kurt Dukoc, Raymond Fletcher, Perry Haichu and William Beach Baker. And on the board making us sound good every week is Lawrence. Um, we'd like to lead off with some stories that happened last week. The Libertarian Party at the Hustler Cup. Whoa, whoa. Wild weekend. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. I met some really, really, really great people there. So did I. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you did, Raymond. I heard that you were just so overcome that somebody had to, they hated on you so much they threw you out of your chair. Because well, yeah. you was getting all the action with all the ladies. <laughs> you know, stuff happens. I can't help it that I'm a popular gentleman. <laughs> But yeah, we had a, we had first Friday. We had a lot of visitors down at our booth. I want to thank all our new listeners, all the people that texted and signed up for our newsletter. Oh yeah, there were a lot of people out at first Friday that 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 signed up for our newsletter by texting we can to two eight two eight eight two eight two two eight oh two two just think of a two two and you remember <laughs> two eight two two eight. And then the Libertarian Party, along with... A dab party yesterday. Oh, it was, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> is that all you can say? I bet. <laughs> it, it, was, it, it was, you know, it was indeed a crazy weekend because prior to even the events of Saturday evening, I went to a, a raucous uh, Democratic, Clark County Democratic Central Committee meeting. So it was... A it, raucous one? Uh, what what it, happened? Apparently, one of the candidates who uh, was not selected uh, during this past election, they want to hire as a consultant to get more Democratic candidates elected. Wow. My, my question was, is uh, no respect, no disrespect to this individual, but if you can't even get yourself elected, how are you going to get other Democrats elected? Ooh. <laughs> but apparently people didn't like that question. Oh, my goodness. Well, yes. I was going to say, you know, a tick at Tick Seegerbloom's party having uh, John Osagira be the bartender was quite satisfying. He stopped our bill two legislative sessions ago. You remember that, Perry? I can't believe what I just heard. That's hilarious. I mean, that, yeah. you're not making that up, are no, you? No, I am no. not making that up. I was just like, That's I funny. was just like, he, he came up to me and he said, oh, I'm doing consulting for mar medical marijuana businesses. Yeah, yeah, I bet you are. And I looked at him and I go, Oh, weren't you, you know, weren't you, you know, running for, you know, Congress or something like that? Da, 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 da. And, you know, he didn't get, he didn't get selected. So whatever. But he was a bartender at Tick's, uh, Tick's little soiree. Yeah, um, yeah definitely. Don't drink the Kool-Aid. Certainly not whatever <laughs> Kool-Aid he's serving. Yeah, really. So, no, I did not make that up. And it was totally satisfying. Yeah, um, we had the Libertarian Party. Uh, the head of the Libertarian Party from California was in town. So that's why the Libertarians were doing so many different events, including hosting the Weed TV you know, with Weed TV at the Hustler Club. And, you know what? And initially we took some uh, we took some flack for being involved in a um, in an event that cannabis. was hosted at the Hustler Club by people that don't live in Las Vegas, of course. Yeah, we were being attacked by some some uh, people up in Seattle, Washington, of all places. Yeah, and and the, the thing I have to say about that is that we support our sex industry workers here in Las Vegas. We support uh, political parties, and we also support you know anybody that has to do good cannabis agenda, and also fellow cannabis activists here in Las Vegas. We try to be very inclusionary and, and not exclude people. Yeah, and just because this event is held at the Hustler Club, I mean, in all reality, this was held on the second floor of the Hustler Club, and last time the rooftop, this time the rooftop was closed. But there were some girls up there, but really not many. And unless you bought a dance and they took you into the back private room area, I mean, it was just, it was just a venue in all reality. 
Yeah. A good bunch of haters going to hate. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's all I'm going to say. You know, they, they're going to hate that they're not Las Vegas for sure or Nevada. Yep. And another big thing we had in town this weekend, the oh, Secret Cup the was secret in town. Cup. <laughs> this was the this was the finals too the the, the year end finals so we had some of the greatest concentrate and uh, extraction makers in the in the United States. Now they only sold a hundred tickets for this, and supposedly everybody was uh, everybody was a patient. But I I I know people that went that were not patients. But hey, whatever makes some money, huh? <laughs> I'd, li- I'd like to go to it next year if they don't have anything organized like on a how do I put this a. Uh, more public level. Well, you know, by, it's, by a, that it's time. the sh- secret cup. I know. I'm, I'm, <laughs> well, some, they're trying. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I don't think they want a very big turnout for this. No, it's no, no, basically, of not. you know, industry people and, you know, people. Dab in, makers. Yeah, dab makers. And <laughs> Concentrate makers. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. I don't know if I could handle doing, you know, 60 to 80 different dabs in three days myself anyway. I mean. Maybe Perry could. <laughs> 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 do you think that is a challenge, Perry? Oh, I, um. I would do my best to keep up. Let's put it that way. <laughs> uh, I went to the can. I was fortunate enough to attend the cannabis cup in San Bernardino last time around, and it, it was just really an unbelievable time. I had uh, there was this you know a quote medicating area where that's kind of sectioned off from the rest of the show. The vendors and things like that, like the uh, what do they call that? The uh, convention hall, I guess, for sure. the main yeah. areas, and then they have the medicating area outside. And these booths, it's just. Like you step into this world of dab smoke, uh, very. It, it's really uh, that place is where I realized how popular the the this dab culture has become. Yeah. Uh, let's say there's 600 booths there, and maybe a hundred of them are giving out uh, dabs. I mean, less than a dozen are actually giving out flowers. They're almost all doing wax now. And yeah. It's just that's it, the it, culture. It, yeah, it's just exploded like. Like I never foresaw. Like I saw it coming. Like oh, it's going to be popular. People are going to like this. But never Not did I think that it would level. get like it is. No. All right. Well, speaking of secrecy, secrecy in regulation. Oh boy. Oh boy. Yeah. Exactly. You know all those uh, applications that were submitted to the state, and you had to put unidentified on it, and they removed this piece of paper that identified who you were, so they could all be judged equally with no bias and anything else. There were people that submitted five different applications, but essentially it was the same application, and they got scored very, very, very differently at the state. And so now there's some concern as to, wait, how how was this process exactly handled? Mm. And if you got your score, if you're one of the ones that got your score, there was supposed to be this nice breakdown of all the scores. Well, there is a process where you can find out what the breakdown of the scores are, but it's it's kind of a... It, it's kind of uh, a roundabout process. I called the state. I called Pam Graver, and she's the educational officer for the medical marijuana program for the state of Nevada. Okay. And she gave me uh, a number of a, of a man that is here in in town, and they have an office here in town, and they gave the breakdown of your scores individually to you. But you have to go through this little process to get it. And then you look at the scores, and we were looking at our scores thinking, wow, you know, we had a really good this, we had a really good this. And so this would give us a place to shoot for next year, um, you know, if we apply again as a dispensary. But a lot of people, including the Pearl Valley Times, see that it's not a transparent process, and it wasn't an, a, um, a, a process that just was that was the gold standard. Remember them saying, oh, yeah, the of, of the course. Year, this well, is going to be a gold standard. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. But they, uh, hindsight's they, 2020, right? <laughs> exactly. But, but the thing is, is that we didn't know who was scoring these applications. We didn't know, you know, what criteria, even though they gave a criteria, they didn't say these, you know, these points based, you know, for cameras and this and that and the other. And so there there were applications that were the same application that got different scores. Mm -hmm. And so you're a teacher, Raymond, uh, or you've known, been known to teach occasionally. I dab bull. (laughs) You dab bull. (laughs) Um, but as a teacher and I, and I've been an educator in, in, in my past also, as you're grading a hundred patient patients, as you're grading a hundred applications or a hundred papers, um, don't you, tend to have a bias 
I mean, do you grade them exactly the same, or are by the hundreds when you're tired, you're hungry, you're you're this, you're that? You are kind of absolutely right. You know, when I start grading, I, I try to section off the number of papers because, you know, when you're grading, and and I'm I'm a math teacher. When you're grading math, you're looking to make sure that they did the problem right and their answer is correct. Correct. So, so you're looking for two separate things. And and that's kind of black and white. Now, if you're grading essays. Which I'm also known to dabble in <laughs> English teaching as well. Yes, when you're reading grammar and spelling and punctuation, it's it's a whole nother beast of grade. And it's and it's also got a variable on it, and that you may be tired, you may be hungry, you well, may be well. Let's let's take tired of grading. This is true, but let's just take the fact for a moment that both of us have dabbled, and I'm going to keep doing that. I'm sorry. Okay. In education. <laughs> um, and we are we are four or five, six individuals in this room. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's say we're hired on part-time by the state, and we're trained. Yep. We're all each individuals. How I view an application may be different than the way Perry views it, may be different than the way Kurt views it, even though we, we receive the same uh, kind of training. And, course, and a criteria on which to grade. You see, you're supposed to grade it this way. Yeah, but you I think could... that was the whole idea, was to have this merit-based process to be broken down in such a specific way that there was no um, no room for... Error, you know, no gray area, basically. Yeah, there was no room for individual bias in this process, or at least that was the theory behind it. So, you know, <laughs> I mean, this push and pull between the county and the municipalities has been, or the state and the local municipalities has been going on almost since the law was the law was passed or even before. Exactly. So, so they had three months and they reviewed hundreds of thousands of patient uh, of patients of papers and documents. And what, what I'm saying is that how can you be objective with that much information, that many people, and just a loosely based criteria. Well, I, I think they should have been objective only because each individual, the way I was understanding it, the way the process was explained is, okay, I'm going to look at X, you're going to look at Y, and he's going to look at Z. I'm only focusing on X, and I give my grades and scores for that. And then I move it on to the next person, and they score the next portion of the application. Well, but no one knows how they were graded. But like, well, while while all this continues to get hammered out in, in council meetings, the patients continue to not have safe access to their medicine, which is what this was supposed to be all about from the beginning you know there's a story that came down from the review from the review journal today that said that the medical marijuana dispensaries from clark county are delayed due to a pending lawsuit yep and and that's funny you said that because uh chris june kiliani and tick seager bloom were on ed bernstein's show on sunday and they said that the lawsuits would not hold up the opening of any of these dispensaries. So unfortunately, our elected officials misspoke yet again. Yeah. And both those people are my friends. So I don't, you know. Well, not here, on well here we right. go from the Review Journal. The indefinite delay, which came at the request of the district attorney's office, and the, said the lawsuit could postpone the opening of almost half of the 18 dispensaries allowed in unincorporated areas, unincorporated areas of the county. It's the latest development in a conflict between the state and the county over the new medical marijuana dispensary selection process. The widening dispute developed after the county issued special use permits only to 18 for medical marijuana dispensaries from a pool of nearly 80. Under the state law, up to 18 dispensaries are allowed in unincorporated Clark County. County leaders said they could be months away from making any decision until this all goes before a judge. This is... This is crazy. It is crazy, and, it, and it's, it's huge in one area that they're not going to open up dispensaries, but they are not going to open up dispensaries in Clark County. In Clark Henderson, County, exactly. Henderson, meanwhile, yeah, has got exactly. one near the fucking the Buffalo Wild Wings. Yeah, Ooh, exactly. I almost said it. You can actually uh, look in here soon. It looks like Henderson is looking to get ready to approve a medical license at the Galleria Mall. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> well, so you can do your Christmas shopping in more ways than one. <laughs> and I don't think hot. it's going to be open in that time, but the, the, the sentiment is still there. It's not like they're going to have now, the, the mall walkers are now going to have more help. Now, from what I, I gathered from that article, it wasn't actually like their first choice. They kind of got pushed into this area and they're like, look, this is within zoning. So this is where we want to be now. So if you would have just let us, 
you know, yeah. operate where we wanted to operate originally. Yeah. I think the problem was what, like some, there was a wetlands park that was an undeveloped area of a yeah, the park. And then they were like, no, it's too close. You know, the boundaries are the boundaries and we're not going to flex for you. And yeah. that was it. And what's yeah, weird is it. that wetlands, those wetlands are not only undeveloped, they plan to keep them undeveloped no, because I, oh, that's yeah. our natural resource. Yeah, that's the whole well, idea. I understand. Well, but we we wouldn't like, want any of the birds or small animals over there being, you know, Medicated. <laughs> Medicated or, or influenced to medicate. <laughs> that would be rules, rules are rules, I guess. You know, I mean, I think it'd be kind of funny for them to get it at the gallery. I wonder what kind of precedent that was set for other... Uh, I mean, I know it's not actually in the mall. It's in like a building, but it's still on gallery or property. I yeah, know. Exactly. And can, you and think of the, can you think of the flow over from Buffalo Wild Wings to the... <laughs> <laughs> You know, not not only Henderson's looking at the applications, Las Vegas is taking a second look. Um, they granted a reprieve to rejected medical marijuana applicants. With the threats of lawsuits looming, city leaders decided New Leaf, one of 10 marijuana shops hopefuls turned away by the city council during a two-day permit hearing, should get a chance to find a new location for the shop it proposed at 4500 West Charleston. Yeah. As long as it's within, what, five miles? Five mile within five radius. miles. They said they could go up to the state and ask for that. Now, I'm, I I don't know how I feel about this because what they actually did is New Leaf, Not, oh. New no. Leaf actually um, withdrew their no, 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 no. I'm going to get to them. Oh, no. I'm okay. getting to them next. That's another one. Okay. Yeah, I'm getting to them next. I'm, I'm going through it. Um, this comes a little more than a month after the city leader signed off on land use and licensing approval for most of the city's cannabis hopefuls, plowing ahead with license for 27 dispensaries only days before the state issued its opinions. It came only hours after Clark County held off on thinning its application pools, citing a pendant lawsuit. Um, city leaders uh, this past Wednesday also br br breathed breath, I don't know how you say it properly, uh, life into desert air wellness a long dead pot shop proposal which was pulled at the applicant's request in late october so this that's the one these that's are the, the people that pulled their application yeah, from consideration and are now in essence resubmitting it after the deadline if you pull something from consideration and you resubmit it, you're doing that. You're resubmitting it. Ergo, you're submitting it again when other applicants are not allowed the same opportunity. And it's not fair. I was just going to say, yeah, if they're being uh, reviewed, why can't other applicants possibly have their applications reviewed also? In exactly. This process? And guess who the lawyer was on it? On both of them. On both of them. Who? Our friend Jay Brown. Oh, Jay oh, Brown. Okay, well. <laughs> <laughs> City leaders have agreed to hear uh, Desert Air Wellness on December 17th. Yes. So if you are disappointed in the process, or if you agree with the process, please go down either and support and oppose. I know I'm going to stringently oppose this application for violation of the, of the procedures, period. Well, you know, and, and that's just it. If, if they have they've bypassed procedure or found a way that they think that they can bypass procedure you know how you know how the city council does they make up their own rules if it's okay yeah i was just gonna say i, I would have to read the language in the like the original bill draft language to see if there's anything preventing them from like withdrawing or resubmitting or how that application process works were they the only ones who withdrew and then resubmitted is that why that is being, the only one that's the know, only one okay see that's probably why they're giving it such a special look just because they're the only one you know. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I don't know. I well, don't know. you know, um, we're going to go on a break, and then we're going to come back with our uh, guest, Lanny Swernlow, and he is the host uh, of Marijuana Compassion and Common Sense Radio Program in Palm Springs, California. All right. We'll see you in a minute. Cannabis has been used as a healing medicine for over 5,000 years with no toxic side effects. Is it right for you? The professionals at Dr. Reefer are here to help. Now accepting new patients, make an appointment today at 428-0000. Bring your medical records, or if you don't have them, their staff will work to document your qualifying condition with a 99% approval rate. If you have any of the following conditions, cancer, AIDS, muscle spasm diseases, severe nausea, severe pain, Crohn's disease, glaucoma, or PTSD, call Dr. Reefer today for your free consultation and their money-back guarantee. If you don't qualify, you don't pay. 
Call 702-428-0000 to get your Nevada medical marijuana card today. Green Spot Hydroponics is a Las Vegas-based distributor of specialty indoor and outdoor gardening supplies. Locally owned and operated with over 3,000 square feet of inventory. Expert and friendly staff to help you with all your growing and hydroponic needs. Our pricing and service will not be beat. We help you grow. 3355 Westlake Mead Boulevard, just behind the Texas station. Mention we can and receive 10% off. Call us at 702-463-6000. That's 702-463-6000. You're listening to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour, produced by We Can, the wellness education cannabis advocates of Nevada. We Can is a 501c3 nonprofit. If you're interested in sponsoring us, donating, or advertising on this radio show, please contact our advertising department at 702 218 5226 or Kurt, K U R T, at WeCan702.org. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. That sound indicates it's time for our 420 moment where we honor somebody who's made a uh, difference in the movement. And today we're going to honor Seth Rogen. All right. Yeah. Seth Rogen has been a long time uh, cannabis, open cannabis user and activist. Um, he, uh, he was born on April 15th, 1982. He's a Canadian actor, comedian, and filmmaker. He began his career performing stand-up comedy during his teenage years, winning the Vancouver Amateur Comedy Contest in 1998. So, um, Rogan has spoke out about awareness of Alzheimer's disease. No one in his biological family has it, but it runs on his wife's side and has affected her mother for several years. Rogan says, I think until you see it firsthand, it's hard to conceive of how brutal it is. So... Oh, he's on a couple of weed-related movies like Pineapple Express and Neighbors and things like that, so people kind of take him jokingly, but he is a serious activist. And most recently, he was put on the cover of Rolling Stone. As, uh, and, you know, they were mo- like, I don't want to say they were mostly talking about his activism, but I thought the primary you know, focus of the article was mostly about his, his love of cannabis, which was kind of fun. So, you know, thanks again, Seth Rogen. Really, you know, and I never laughed so hard is that that scene in Pineapple Express where they're fighting and he's like, dude, dude, quit it, quit it, quit it. And they like stop. And I'm like, that's just like some people that I would know (laughs) for sure. So Seth Rogen, we honor you. And um, now we're on to our guest that is the host of the radio show Marijuana Compassion and Common Sense Radio Program in Palm Springs. This is Lanny Swerdlow. Hi, thank you for uh, having me on the show. Thank you for coming out. Thank you for coming out. So uh, it's very it's very easy to, to come out to your show. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Um, so you are an RN and you are a cannabis activist. How long have you been in activism? How long have you been an well, activist? Um, I started. Uh, I, I, I've been smoking cannabis all my life since I was uh, 19, but I became came active in 1995. At that time, I, um, I had a very close friend who had uh, contracted AIDS, and he was a kind of a roly poly guy that had wasted away down to next to nothing. And I saw that his use of cannabis, uh, you know, helped him uh, stimulate his appetite, so he'd eat, keep his weight on, stay alive. Uh, also, he was on a veritable cocktail of different drugs, most of which had some very negative side effects. And the cannabis helped mitigate the side effects, so he would stay compliant with his medication. And in 1995, AIDS was considered a terminal disease. You got AIDS, you died, so it was kind of depressing. And the cannabis, of course, helped lift the spirits, made him feel better. And in order to get this medicine that made him feel better and stayed compliant with medication and eat and kept his weight on and stay alive, either I or some of his friends, We'd have to go out on the streets and deal with criminals to get them to medicine. And that, I thought, was just crazy. Uh, and I began, that was my first introduction to that cannabis is more than something you kick back, relax with, and smoke with your friends. It really does have important medicinal purposes. And so I got involved. I was living in Portland at that time. I, I got involved with uh, their medical marijuana law initiative in 1998. They, they group asked to produce a uh, TV show for cable access television about what they were doing and so I since I was doing that for some other things I produced a weekly TV show called uh, Cannabis Common Sense um, and uh, and when I left Oregon and I moved down into uh, California in the Palm Springs area I kind of kept getting involved there but uh, wound up forming an organization down there 
uh, called the Marijuana Prohibition Project. That's been very active in the Union Empire, uh, working on medical marijuana issues and marijuana law reform issues. Now, Lanny, when I introduced you before, uh, I just introduced you as Lanny Swerdlow. Um, you're actually an RN also, so there are some initials after your name. Um, yeah. And so you be- did you become an RN up in Oregon, or was it before this? Uh, no, I actually became an RN down here in California kind of late in life. I, uh, one of the reasons, but not the only reason, one of the reasons I became an RN is because I was really convinced about the importance of cannabis for uh, the health of the communities. And uh, uh, as an RN, I would be taken more seriously talking about that issue. And it's That's very awesome. true. I am taken very seriously because I have the RN. I also have the initials LMC, Legal Notice Consultant, uh, after my name as well. So um, it kind of helps. That's that's awesome that that you chose to um, start a second or third career so late in life that that is uh, that would put you under significant you know um, student debt. I know uh, getting an RN isn't cheap. Well, uh, it's not that expensive when you go to community college. Oh. A couple thousand bucks is all it cost me, so it wasn't too bad. Well, right on. Well, thank you. You know, thank you for uh, doing that and and shining light on the cannabis with your with your medical degree. Um, so you well, have that, you have the show Marijuana just, Compassion and Common Sense. Um, how long have you been doing that radio show, and 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 what is the thrust of your show, and and you know who are some of your guests, et cetera? Well, actually, it's after I came after I came to up to uh, Palm Springs after doing the shows for a number of years in Portland. Uh, I'd been there about five years, and I decided I really wanted to get back into the studio. And so through the cable access, I started producing a show called Marijuana, Compassion, and Common Sense. And I did that for about uh, four years. And then the show, I just wasn't reaching much of an audience. And I had the opportunity to go on KCA Radio for a while, and I did the show there. And that's when I started. And that was back in 19, excuse me, 19, uh, in 2009 that we started doing the show uh, there. Eventually, it morphed off of KCA, and now it's just an internet radio-based show on blogtalkradio.com slash marijuana news. But uh, we won a number of awards. Uh, we won uh, four years in a row the Inland Empire Weekly's best uh, readers poll, where the readers actually voted on uh, different things that they liked the best, and we were continually rated as the best radio talk show host in the, in, in the Inland Empire. So that was kind of cool. Congratulations. I definitely. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and so what um, what type of topics do you guys talk about, or do you talk about on your radio show, or is it just a wide, wide, wide variety? Every, every show we have uh, two interviews. Uh, like uh, last time we had uh, uh, a person from, his name was uh, Paul McCarrier. He's from Legalized Maine, uh, working to legalize marijuana in the state of Maine with an initiative ballot. And then we had uh, Tim Blake from the Emerald Cup. Uh, here in California, in Sonoma County, it's a big that's coming up. Cup. That's coming up this weekend, and it's uh, and he was on there telling everybody all about what's going to be happening there and stuff. Uh, one of these years, I want to get up there. It really sounds like a lot of fun, doesn't yeah. it? We were thinking about renting like a party bus and going up there and everything, but it was just <laughs> it, it, it was just with our schedules as full as they are, it wasn't just it really wasn't feasible. And I I know yeah. as an activist that you're probably really really busy. Um, I think that's a disease that we activists get is the busyness disease. <laughs> I'm not I'm not sure I'd call it a disease, but you're right. We get very busy. <laughs> yeah, the, the Emerald Cup is one that I definitely have oh, on my, my wish list. Yeah, you may answer when you call it disease. Cannabis works very well for that disease because it'll calm us down and, and give us some more seconds so we don't get so so wrapped up in something that we forget about um, enjoying life. Well, for sure. What's going on in the activism world in your, you know, in your uh, neck of the woods, as well, they say? Well, you know, the thing, the thing that I'm most involved in right now, if you don't mind me putting a little pitch in for it. No, uh, no, it's called, it's, it's called the Brownie Mary Democratic Club. You know... Uh, I was part of a collective that was operating here in, in the city of Riverside. Uh, just by luck of the draw, and I hate to say this is, you know, Las Vegas luck, we were the ones that were sued by the city, and our lawsuit went, uh, ours was the one that went all the way up to the California Supreme Court to decide whether cities can ban medical marijuana collectives from operating in their, in their cities, even though they're permitted under state law, can they ban it? And unfortunately, we lost and cities uh, could ban it. 
And as I, when I was going through that two-year process and looking around, seeing what was going on and stuff, I began to realize that the problem that we are having, uh, making significant strides in this kind of stuff, is that we have no political clout. Uh, for the most part, except for a, a number of politicians you can count on the fingers of one hand, uh, they don't care about us. Uh, we go to, you know, uh, and, and there's no reason why they should, really. I mean, we go to our city councils, we go to our county boards, we go to our state legislatures, and we say we want this, we want that, we want this, we want that. And what have we ever done for them? Have we exactly gotten, yeah, have we ever gotten out and donated money to their campaigns? Have we hit the pavement in precincts? They're putting on door hangers saying, we haven't done a damn thing. And, and, you, and, and that's and largely the truth. If if, if usually people sad but true, uh, people don't want to get out and you know and help. Pol- that's why I mean, when politicians right. hold so stuff I, here, I I put it out to my people. To so help. I started to look around and say, well, how do we get involved? Well, how do we? How can we get involved politically? And I began looking around, and um, I thought there's other groups that have gotten involved politically and have done very well. And the one I kind of model myself after is Stonewall Democrats. Now, this, oh, yeah. These are, the gay, these are the gay Democrats. They're powerful. And, and, yeah, and what they have done is that every in most states, Nevada is one of them. Yes, they California, are. There is, there is a uh, county central committee for the political parties. There is a Democratic central committee, and there's a Republican central committee. That's true. And within these central committees... They uh, have interest groups. African Americans form a club. Environmentalists form a club. Uh, fly fishermen form a club. You know, certain regions. You know, South Las Vegas could form a club. You know, those type of things. And they join the Democratic, the, the local county committee, and through the Democratic Party, they work to further their cars. They support the Democrats. Democrats get out to support them. So, I went to Riverside County, where uh, I. Uh, where I reside in California, and I applied to form a, a club. Now, it was interesting. When I first applied to form the club, I was going to call it the Cannabis Democratic Club. And if I, you know, cannabis, not marijuana, isn't that much? But a, exactly. number, of people, a number of people in the, in the county central committee said, oh, no, 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 you can't <laughs> name a club after a Schedule One drug. <laughs> and I got a little pissed off at that, and I said, oh, well, then I'll call it the pot Democratic Club. But, but you know, I began, I, <laughs> once again, I looked back at Stonewall and what they did, what the gay community did. And they didn't name it the Gay Democratic Club. They named it after an event or a person, like the Harvey Milk Democratic Club or yeah. Stonewall Democratic Club. So I thought, that's what I'm going to do. So who should I name this Democratic, this Democratic Club after? And the first person came to mind was Bob Marley. You know, <laughs> but I thought, I thought, wait a minute, dreadlocks is going to melt no, He's not. Gonna you, yeah, you're going to. You, a lot of people so are just going to say, nah. Yeah, then I thought of Dennis Prone. Dennis Prone is the father of medical marijuana here in California. If it wasn't for Dennis Prone, we will, probably wouldn't be having these medical marijuana laws going throughout the state, of, uh, throughout the nation. And but then I know Dennis Prone, and I know the minute the club did something he didn't like, Dennis would be calling me and saying, "Lanny, take my name off that club," you know. And I didn't want to. So I began looking around, who else? And I discovered Mary Jane Rathburn. Uh, Mary Jane Rathburn had the moniker Brownie Mary. She got that because when she was in her 70s, uh, she, and in the 90s, she started uh, baking marijuana-infused brownies and taking them to the AIDS patients in San Francisco hospitals. She got arrested three times for doing this, never prosecuted. Eventually, the city actually named it day in her honor, Brownie Mary Day. But I thought this would be so appropriate to name it after her, and for a couple reasons. One reason, of course, it kind of shows the dichotomy of marijuana, the importance of it. First, first of all, it's very important for health and, and medical reasons. For AIDS patients, it's, it's absolutely a lifesaver for many AIDS patients. So it shows a serious side, but also Brownie Mary kind of kind of a fun side to it as well. Yeah, and it kind of thumbs marijuana, the has a fun, marijuana has a fun side. We enjoy marijuana. That's one of its attributes, that it's enjoyable. So it's got both those things. And the other thing that, uh, is, that, is that this is a male-dominated movement, and we have to do something to showcase the achievements that women have made. And so naming it after the Brownie Mary Club, after Mary Jane Rathborn, is one of those things we do to highlight and showcase the achievements that women have made in the movement to... Uh, uh, bring it into marijuana prohibition. So that's, that's what we did. So I formed the club, and it got chartered. We are the first marijuana interest group ever to be officially affiliated with a major political party. And, uh, and that's awesome. 
We now have expanded. There are six Rowdy Mary Democratic clubs that have been chartered by their Democratic Central Committees. They have, we have them in Los Angeles County, San Francisco County, Sacramento County, Alameda County, and San Bernardino County. And we've got another couple counties that are being, being formed right now. And I talked to somebody in Las Vegas who said they're going to try to form one in Las Vegas, uh, in, in, in Clark County. It's Clark County, right? In Clark County. Um, well, Kurt, I mean, not Kurt, but uh, Raymond's on the Democratic Central Committee. Yeah, so you they, are, I mean, aren't you a member? Yeah, I'm, I'm a member of uh, the Clark County and the State Democratic Party Central Committee. And, you know, you should form a Brownie Mary Democratic Club there. We've had tremendous success here. One of the most important things that we've gotten through, uh, I was elected a delegate to the California State Democratic Convention 2013, 2014. In 2014, we introduced a plank into the, Demo- for the Democratic Party, State Party uh, platform calling on marijuana legalization. Now, what they introduced, the platform committee massaged a bit, but what it came out as reading, a Democratic Party supports the legalization, uh, regulation, and taxation of marijuana in a manner similar to tobacco and alcohol. We have a plan and, like uh, that similar here in and Nevada. It, when, when it came to a vote, it was interesting, on Sunday when it came to vote, the last thing of the entire uh, three-day convention is voting on the platform. And when you walk into the platform committee, they hand you a single sheet of 8 and a half by 11 paper. On that paper is about six of the planks. There's over 100 planks that are submitted as being voted on. But they, there's six they wanted to call everybody's attention to. And one was on fracking, another was on education, another on unions. And there it was, marijuana legalization. And, and the party, I mean, the platform chairman, when he got up and was talking to 2,000 plus delegates, saying, we, uh, we want you to be attention to these six because we feel they are major issues of importance to the Democratic Party. And there it was, marijuana legalization. And when he read each one, there was always a spattering of applause. And when he got to ours, which is the last one, the, the place broke out into a round of, it's really a very, a uh, highly supported thing. So we now have. It also largest... sounds really powerful. Like you, you really feel like that you're part of the part of the movement and part of the change in California. Um, well, and to get that kind of acknowledgement, um, I mean, must have been wildly like fulfilling for you. Oh, it, well, what it does, you see, this is the, we now have the largest state political party in the country in favor of marijuana legalization. But even even more importantly is that if you're a Democratic office holder or running for an office that, as a Democrat, you, one of the things you do is you swear to uphold the party platform. Exactly. So that means every single elected Democrat is supposed to be support the party platform, and hence they're supporting marijuana legalization. So when we go meet with them, and we do this, we're constantly meeting with our elected officials, we say, if they're Democrats, we point out, say, listen, the Democratic Party platform now calls for marijuana legalization. Do you support the Democratic Party platform? The party puts them in a weird position. But we've actually had, we've seen a few legislators actually switch who were on the fence and became solidly in favor of, of uh, reform of our marijuana uh, laws because we were able to get the party to support that. That gives them, you know, a it gives them an out. Of, it, it definitely gives them an out. Protective clothing. They said, well, the party supports it. And the fact is, if you are a Democrat, you know, you've seen the poll. Sixty percent or more of Democrats support marijuana legalization. So it's, it's, it's really a safe issue. Why are poli- our political leaders are so scared and still run from the issue, you know, you well, know, traditionally, the, the it, traditionally, it's just it's been a, it's been a bad stance to take. It's more of a libertarian stance to take. And but now that they've got more. now they've got, uh, you know, safe access, if you were to saying that it's OK uh, by their party, then it gives them not only an out, but it also gives them somebody else to blame. Oh, listen, I, I, my party supports this and therefore I am, you know, towing the party line for sure. Well, not, not only that, you have uh, Big Pharma. You know, a lot of these legislators, a lot of these elected officials get money, especially Democrats, from big drug companies. Well, Republicans, too. Uh, one more thing I wanted to talk to you about, uh, Lanny, is Prop 47. Yes. Um, how, how do you see Prop 47 uh, affecting California? I mean, now that it's, you know, calling it to be reclassified, um, you know, the people won't have jail time. Do you see the prisons maybe emptying? Or? Well, that's one of the things that the, the cops are making this big scare story over uh, is um, uh, is is that all these prisons are all these, all these prisoners can be released from prison because 
you can now petition to get out because if you were convicted on your felony and now it's a misdemeanor. So they're going to be, you know, thousands, I guess, of prisoners are going to be released over the next six months or so. And, and that's cost, great. Oh, my God. I think it's a great thing. I, I think it's a great thing, and but I guess the cops are using scare tactics. And it was like, well, if they weren't, if it, if it wasn't illegal in the first place, and and if it was just a me- misdemeanor in the first place, those people never would have been in prison. But, but you have to understand that cops oppose Proposition Forty Seven. The District Attorneys Association opposed Proposition Forty Seven. They did not want to see these felonies because you know because they make you know, this how they get their power. And so now that they lost, they lost it, and by a large margin, it was like almost 60% voted uh, for Proposition 47. Uh, they're going to scare everybody. They're going to try. Maybe they can get it to go back again. I don't know what they're thinking. But, no, it's a wonderful thing. I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's going to save the state hundreds of millions of dollars every year in, Amen. in uh, prison costs. And, uh, you know, these, ra- these laws, these drug laws are racially biased. It's the new oh. Jim Crow, of course. It is. And, and so this is going to have a major impact on the uh, communities of color and, keep- and keeping their young men out of jail. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, 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 a, I mean, it's a wonderful thing to have happened. And, uh, and, and it kind of shows that the people of California, and this is not just California. As I understand it from polls across the nation, people have finally got fed up. Uh, with the war on drugs, and they're willing to start, you know, this soft, they're, they're not willing to buy the old adage that if you're not in favor of the war on drugs, you're soft on crime. They don't buy that anymore. Uh, Absolutely. And, and, uh, and I, so I think we're going to see some big changes. But this is, real, just real quickly, this is why marijuana, why I have gotten so involved in marijuana legalization. To me, the bottom line of everything I am doing is to end the war on drugs. Amen. The war on drugs is racist, it's inhumane, yes. it's ineffective. To me, it's the moral equivalent of ending, of, of ending the war on drugs is the more, like the moral equivalent of ending slavery. I don't know whether it's worse to be a slave or be in prison, but it's not good, and we've got to stop it. But if we cannot legalize marijuana, if marijuana cannot be legalized, we will never end the war on drugs. Marijuana legalization is the absolute linchpin. And the cops know it. And, and that's, that's right. why they're fighting us so much. Because they know if marijuana gets legalized, the end of the war on drugs isn't far behind. And war on drugs is a $50 billion a year pig trough hmm. of money. Pig trough. And lawyers <laughs> and judges and prison guards. Lanny, how, how, would, how would our listeners find you if they wanted to listen to your show? Well, it's at blogtalkradio.com slash marijuana news blogtalkradio.com slash marijuana news. Marijuana news. And, and would you be willing talk, to ha- would you be I willing said, well, I, well, go would, ahead. would you be willing to have us on your show? Of course. I'd love to have you on your show. Fantastic. All righty. Well, we're getting ready to wrap up and take our last break here, Lanny. You're always more than welcome to stay on the line and listen in, or we can uh, go ahead and uh, converse a little more offline. Okay, real good. I'm going to have to get somewhere. So, but thank you very much for having me on the show. Thank uh, you. Thank you, and I, I, I will be in touch with you, Lanny. This is Raymond. I will, I will be in to touch that. with you. Okay, take care now. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. All right, uh, that was uh, Lanny from... Wardlow, RN, and he was with M- uh, Marijuana Compassion and Common Sense Radio on Blog Talk Radio. And we are going to take our final break. When we come back, we'll have more regional news. Stay tuned. Finally, Nevada medical marijuana dispensaries are opening, but you must have your medical marijuana card to get inside. Call the friendly team at Karma Holistic Health Foundation, toll free, 855-420-1110, or visit GetMedicalMarijuanaNow.com. Karma Holistic Health Foundation will give you legal access to medical marijuana. All veterans receive a discount, 855-420-1110, or visit GetMedicalMarijuanaNow.com. You're listening to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour, produced by We Can, the wellness education cannabis advocates of Nevada. We Can is a 501c3 nonprofit. If you're interested in sponsoring us, donating, or advertising on this radio show, please contact our advertising department at 702 218 5226 or Kurt, K U R T, at WeCan702.org. The Vaughn Dank Group offers turnkey solutions for all your cannabis needs, bringing transparency and responsibility to a young budding industry. 
helping patients by producing the cleanest, safest, and most potent medicines and infusibles possible. The Von Dank Group is a design, management, and consulting corporation with over 30 years of industry experience and knowledge of the dispensary, edibles, infusible kitchen, and large-scale cultivation of cannabis manufacturing facilities. Let the Von Dank Group help you grow your cannabis business from seed to green. www.vondank.com Hi, welcome back everybody. This is Nevada Cannabis News. Um, <laughs> Raymond's freaking out right now. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're having a little debate here about good vape pens. So if any of you know a good vape pen that'll last more than a couple of weeks and you know you've had good luck with it, Hit us up on Facebook and let us know. Yeah, or if you have any samples or products you want some test dummies to test, <laughs> this dummy will probably test it for you. <laughs> oh, here, let's jump right into regional news. I got a little bit of news from Alaska, which recently uh, legalized recreational marijuana during their during the November election. And, right on, uh, yeah. Already the local governments are, you know, kind of shaking their finger at it. You know, some of the local municipalities are a little leery of, of uh, introducing recreational dispensaries to their communities right away you know of course the same <laughs> there are a lot of uh, arguments being brought up that of course should have been addressed a long time ago such as hey you know we didn't have we didn't have uh any dispensaries we didn't have any breaking in period yeah we didn't have any soft you know we're just going to jump from stop to stop to full speed yeah and uh and you that know, is a concern. Well, and, and it is what it is. You know, these are things that should have been talked about a long time ago. But you know, luckily there are a lot of municipalities and states and other things that are doing it right, and they can kind of look to them for, for help. And uh, Anchor- and I hope they will well, for sure. In Anchorage, there's a lady named Amy Dembowski who's like an assembly member who's trying to introduce a ban on all recreational marijuana establishments within Anchorage. Before she was trying to introduce the motion before the bill was even certified as legit or before the the ballot initiative was even certified as legit and uh, it's just kind of the same and i know a lot of people up there who are really upset about it but i'm not really too worried about it because we ran into that same kind of thing here in las vegas we did all of everyone was as soon as sb 374 passed everyone was up in arms like we're not going to have this in our communities and they all folded yep they all, all of the municipalities folded. like a stack as of cards well it took a mm-hmm. while i think who, who was first was it the county first uh, Clark County, because yeah. Chris G, yeah, Chris Clark G has County been a proponent of, of medical forever. cannabis forever. Yeah, she then, helped write the original yeah, say, back when she, she was in back, the assembly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you know, and then the city, and then Henderson, and, and uh, I think Boulder City was the only holdout who actually stuck to their guns and said no dice. Oh well, yeah. And yeah. then, uh, That's but all even Mormon. Perump, even Mesquite, Perump, Laughlin, they all folded. So it's just like. We can get to these people just one step at a time. Just don't freak out. Just be calm. You know, Fairbanks, they're running into trouble also. Well, not too much trouble, but they're uh, they're just kind of dealing with the implementation of it. They're deciding, you know, what are we going to do when people smoke in public? How much are we going to fine them? Right now, they're thinking it's going to be a $100 fine if you get caught smoking in public in Fairbanks, and that's it, which ain't, you know, that's not so bad. And, it's cheaper uh, than here. Yeah, that's not so bad. So I can I can deal with that. And uh, they're deal they're trying to figure out whether they're going to let the alcohol beverage control board deal with the implementation of it of the new law, or whether they're going to form their own new board. And there's kind of a, a back and forth going on between that. So you know, there's a lot going up uh, on up there. And you know, I think they're uh, they're doing it right, and they're having constructive dialogue. And it doesn't seem like anything's getting getting too gummed up so yeah. having having been from alaska perry which one do you think would be better do you think having a liquor control board or do you think creating yet another level of government another bureaucracy sucking off the taxpayer teeth <laughs> well <laughs> well when you put it that way well, you're before, biased i, I, I was going to say no before you put it that way i was going to lean in support of you for sure and i still do because i think that the alcohol beverage control board has the infrastructure and the knowledge to do it already and they haven't really said it it wasn't like our gaming control board where they're like we don't want to touch it we want nothing to do with it they're at least taking a look at it which is a maybe is better than no so uh i would be happy with them just expanding that pre-existing operation no 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 no, and that's true they're used to dealing with special use permits they're used to dealing with regulation they're used to dealing with a regulated product yeah they're ready to roll um so one of the groups i've been working with the committee or the committee to regulate and control cannabis up in alaska is trying to uh trying to uh kind of support that they're like a group of investors and 
and uh, entrepreneurs in the interior of Alaska that are trying to steer this their way, and they're also in support of this. So with uh, their endorsement of the Alcohol Beverage Control Board, I'm definitely also in support of it. But uh, uh, For sure. Anything else from what I ask you there, bud? The certificate, the countdown to the legalization officially began. It's been certified, and you know, all the votes have been tallied. And so, when can we go up there and puff away? Uh, let's see here. Sometime in February. And we could see Russia from his old house. <laughs> I think February twenty third is the magic day. Actually, if you really want to go to Alaska for that, for the celebration party, it'll be in late February. I was gonna say there'll be a big cloud of smoke over the top of not or not uh, not Anchorage because they're trying to ban it. We'll but see. We'll see. Well, I wonder if they can issue that many cops. You know, we could get a bunch of people to just openly smoke and see if the cops can actually get to everybody to write a ticket. <laughs> Won't be my first act of civil disobedience. No, no doubt. And I don't think it'll come to that. I think this is just one lone, vo you know, we have lone wolves all the time. So, oh yeah, definitely. Beach just put a sign in front of me that said it's before breakup. It is before breakup when the, when it becomes uh, legal. So it'll be pretty, pretty cold up there still. So uh, be be aware, <laughs> February is not a nice month. Oh, I guess if you're not familiar with that, breakup is basically when the ice starts melting yeah, and starts mess. breaking up, and everything becomes slushy and nasty. Yeah, it's a it's a mess for about a month up there. Don't <laughs> people don't wash their cars for uh, most of the winter and spring up there? It is what it is. <laughs> right on. So, I would kind of like to touch a little bit more on the uh, the Emerald Cup coming to California this weekend uh, for some of our fans who might not be in town and might be out in Southern California. This is held up in wine country. And uh, Ooh, jelly. the Emerald Cup, like you were saying earlier, that it's all mainly about dabs and concentrate. Well, that's not the basis of the Emerald Cup. The okay. Emerald Cup is, is a a California's flower. premier outdoor organic cannabis flower competition created for by the... Uh, by, for by the state's original growers in the Emerald Triangle. This originally started back up in 1996, where after October, or Croptober as it's more known, would happen, all the growers up there would get together and talk about tips and have a, have a, you know share their medicine that. and that. I and know. That. You see, this shows how much the industry has really grown over the past few years. We're having giant, uh, you know, uh, white collar uh, cannabis events here in Vegas, we're having conventions, they're even having these little sub-conventions of, uh, like, how do I put this, like a niche market, like that's such a niche market, only outdoor, organically grown flower at this competition, and still how many, how many people submitted? Well, there's there's over 600 flowers. In Unbelievable! There, but they also have more than just flower. They have over 800 entries in the buds uh, thing, edibles, tinctures, and topicals. So they have four divisions. Love not it. not dabs and concentrates. Not dabs so. and concentrates. Mm -hmm. So if you're free, go to the Emerald Cup. Speaking of Emerald, uh, Sunday was the Green Spot Hydroponics Grand Opening, um, and some of our longtime listeners won a lot of the uh, door prizes there. And we can, in conjunction with Green Spot Hydroponics is going to have bi-weekly classes on growing and different aspects of growing that will run 12-week cycles and repeat. So if you missed one class, you can always come back, you know, about 12 weeks later and take another class. And they're also going to be available online for viewer viewing pleasure. And this is all as our nonprofit for free. Um, we also have some more public announcements. Uh, Together We Can, our pub, uh, monthly public meeting for patients is on Saturday, December 13th at 2 p.m. between 2 and 4 p.m. Uh, at the Coffee Bean and Tea Leaf across from UNLV. We also have a board meeting at noon at the Weed TV offices, which is our new corporate office. And that's from noon until about 1.45 in the afternoon. The city of Las Vegas has a meeting to rehear a lot of the medical marijuana dispensary cases on December 17th. And, and we have a holiday party coming up December 27th from noon until 5 p.m. You can check our website for more details. That's www.meetup.com forward slash WeCan702 or check out our Facebook at WeCan702 and Twitter. Like us on Facebook, follow us on you, on Twitter, subscribe to our YouTube videos, and we will be back this time next week. And we got all of our pictures on Instagram. Be safe, everybody. Until next week, goodbye. Thank you.